Thank you. So the mic's working. I don't have a clicker. Um, so I was uh, telling the organizers, um, this is actually my first outing since COVID, my first public event. <laughs> so it was a little funny and uh, disorienting this morning to get ready. But it's nice to see all of you here, and hopefully uh, we'll get back to normal. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I am a data scientist. I finished my PhD a long time ago in 2001 where I did work on speech and prosody, pitch accent. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I think throughout my career in the last 20 years, what's really been important and what's changed for data science is um, I was in academia. I was an assistant professor for a while. But I think the really exciting change that's happened is now we have the computational power that we can actually employ these algorithms. They can have an impact. We can do it at scale. So we're no longer building toy systems on our you know, uh, computers in the lab uh, on toy problems with toy data sets. We have real data sets. And certainly, the advent of Web 2.0 also made it so we had a lot more data. Um, so since then, I've really focused my career on, OK, so we have data science. Uh, I got a little less technical and got into management. I've been doing executive roles for a while, but have that scientific background. But really focused on how do we make sure that data science, algorithms, uh, machine learning actually have the impact we know that they can have. Uh, so that's been the focus of my career. Um, I came to, I'm American, as you can tell. I came to the Netherlands in 2014 to work for Elsevier uh, as their SVP of data science. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some use cases there. I'm no longer with Elsevier. Uh, I am working with a couple of local people at Science Park Inc. Um, doing consulting, but also um, uh, working closely with the firm now 24-7 AI as their SVP of data science. Um, so I'm going to, this talk, I'm going to focus less on the technical piece, although uh, to not disappoint the technical people in the audience, I, I do have some uh, formulas and algorithms. <laughs> um, but I'm really going to talk about how to structure for change and how to organize and, and what needs to be in place. And I'll do that through a couple of case studies. Um, so this is just, I, I think in this room we all know this, but the spend on AI is exponentially growing. Um, this has been happening for a long time. This chart looks even more drastic if you uh, go back since I uh, you know, got in the job market and uh, to today. Um, I think what's important about this is, uh, is we all know we should be doing AI. Every company should be doing AI. Elsevier, who had a lot of data, should have been doing AI. Um, every bank. But, um, but are you getting what you need from your investment? That's, that's really... Uh, uh, what I'm here to talk about. I think it's often hard. Um, so I mean, how many of you uh, work in companies where you have an AI group or a data science group, and you, you know you have a lot of really smart people, uh, but you're just not sure exactly what they do? Um, and maybe most of you in this room are data scientists, but that is such a common problem with companies who want to go through digital transformation, with large corporations, um, and I've found even with startups <coughs> uh, sometimes. But basically, you know you have the right people, you know you want to get somewhere, but there's just a, a disconnect between that group. Yeah, we have a lot of really smart people, I just don't know what they do. And this is what usually your senior executives are going to say, right? Yeah, yeah, we have a team. Uh, yeah, we're, t we're dumping a ton of money into it. Uh, but, um, but it's really hard. I'd also like to turn that around a little bit as someone who's been running data science teams at Elsevier, my team was up to 110, that it, you know, there is a lot of investment. You get a lot of uh, uh, kudos in data science for companies because everyone wants to demonstrate they're doing it. But you also have to show something for that value. And I think that's not a way that data scientists are used to thinking, right? It's just not in their DNA. They're, they're focused on this scientific problem. But you really have to show return on investment. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but yeah, so the challenges, of course, are finding the right skill set. Uh, it's hard to find the right people. And it, data scientists are scientists. They want to experiment. They're happy. Look, I'll build this model. You can take it when I'm done. No, I'm not done. <laughs> it's not right yet. Uh, so really working in isolation. Um, lots of organizational constraints. I, I don't know how many companies I've worked with, been in, or consulted with. Uh, where they have a data science group, but it's really orphaned somewhere, and no one's quite sure where to put it. Is it part of operations? Is it part of product? Is it 
uh, in a research division all by itself? Is it part of technology? Uh, so there's, uh, there's different ways that we have to organize to incorporate these skill sets. Um, there's also cultural constraints. A lot of this has to do with the goals in the mind of a data scientist versus uh, the goals of a company. Um, and, and those two, you know, not working together so seamlessly. Um, then there's a, a focus on for whoever your client base is, whether you're in the financial industry, health industry, um, it doesn't matter. You, you really have to answer the question, are my customers ready for this, right? So you, particularly in the health industry, I think there's a lot of effort to help doctors in diagnose, diagnostics, uh, but is the trust really there, right? Do people really want an AI tool to do that? So a lot of the things that you might be trying to automate as a customer, uh, you've... You, you find that your customers, as a company, you find that your customers aren't really uh, quite there yet mentally, right? They're not ready to forego that human uh, part for the algorithm. So you, you really have to think about the industry trust. So I'm just gonna talk about uh, a couple of different use cases and then lessons learned and then a few takeaways. Um, and I have a lot, so I'm gonna skip over a lot, uh, but uh, where's the time? Oh, there's the time, okay. Um, so, uh, Use case one was definitely at Elsevier. Um, it's transforming uh, the challenges that I found in transforming a legacy company. So many of you are Dutch, so many of you know Elsevier, uh, not the magazine, the uh, publishing company though. Uh, they have books and journals, mostly scientific, medical, technical books and journals. Um, but that's half their business, 2.2 billion a year. The other half of their business is database products. So taking that expert content, not just Elsevier's content, but content from uh, uh, third-party publishers, and serving those up to doctors in hospitals with diagnostic tools. Um, Elsevier has software in 3,400 hospitals in the States. Uh, they also have software that focuses on um, in silico drug discovery, so uh, helping the pharmaceutical industry in drug discovery. Um, so that's really half their business. Um, that being said, I think uh, this is a 130-year-old company, and, and obviously they have a business model that's working, but they knew that they needed to modernize. And I was really the first data scientist they brought into the company, um, at least th the first one they brought in in a data science role. Um, and I was brought in to uh, work in the operations division, which is where the company was had this very traditional operations division where all the data was processed, then it gets pushed up to product in this very line linear cycle. And um, uh, operations did that, but the quality of the data and how that was done was determined by product, which is a separate process, completely separate process. Um, operations had metrics like uh, how many, you'll see some of them in here, uh, how many compounds uh, do we have in our database or how many pages per day are we, are we able to process, those kinds of metrics. Completely different than product metrics, which uh, we're moving much more toward uh, your typical online metrics, users per day, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> This linear process is really what you find in legacy systems uh, and legacy companies. It doesn't allow for testing of analytic products. If you change something uh, digitally, uh, can you go back and redo it? Uh, it's not scalable. Um, and you can't make use of that usage data that you get. How many users do I have? Do they click more on this if I use these semantic tags versus these semantic tags? Really important to do, really basic data science, but it's just not part of that cycle. And uh, those were the challenges I had coming into Elsevier, being told, no, nope, build a data science team, you can do this. <laughs> um, uh, which we did. So here's a small use case that I actually started with. And one of the lessons learned you'll see at the end of this talk is, you really have to pick that low-hanging fruit. As someone who's in charge of a fairly large budget, uh, you wanna demonstrate value. It's not always the most sexiest data science problem. It's not always gonna get you an article or a patent in data science, uh, but it will actually do a lot for the company. Um, so there was a very basic business need. Uh, they wanted to increase their market share of a product, a database product that they serve pharmaceutical industries. And they do that by increasing uh, the number of compounds in their database. The problem is, we literally had lots of people in India with masters in chemistry reading articles and putting uh, uh, proteins um, and their properties in a database, literally. Uh, that's what I walked into, so that's, you know, that's a low-hanging fruit. 
uh, right there. Um, so, so that was the process where you actually have people doing this uh, and tagging it. Um, and then the quality was checked by uh, someone on the team in the product team who would look at it. Sometimes they were people in my team, but they would look at it. Oh, yeah, it looks like they got 98% of the information we need from this, right? So our accuracy is 98%. Uh, so just literally by spot checking. Um, and as a data scientist coming in, I thought, OK, I've never worked in an operations division. I just must be missing something. <laughs> right, there's, there's something I'm not understanding. And it took me a while. No, nope, that's really how they do it. OK. So that was uh, uh, one of the first challenges. So yeah, it's also about breaking down the task. So OK, not all of the um, articles have relevant information. So um, the people doing this actually spend a lot of their time trying to decide, should I read through it and, and code this one or not? Simple relevancy, which is a pretty simple uh, uh, data science task. Um, we conquered that by using an SVM classifier. When we actually did inner annotator agreement and started applying scientific principles to um, accuracy, we found that even in this task, um, the experts did not agree on when an article was relevant or not. So we're talking, you know, uh, like 68% um, is all they were getting, and we were easily able to move that up doing this automatically. Um, uh, so that was one piece. The other is uh, we had to do chemical entity extraction from text. Uh, and uh, if any of you have worked in this field, it's, it's a daunting task. We hired a couple of experts um, who actually were from Erasmus who worked on this for their uh, dissertations. Um, and we actually ended up not even picking, building it ourselves. Uh, we incorporated a third party tool from a company who'd been doing entity extraction from, uh, for chemical entities for a long time. So it's not always a, you have to build it yourself. Um, uh, and we were able to pull information out. Um, so the outcomes there are pretty simple. Uh, uh, this is a very uh, operational metric, the cost per compound. Um, and, and it actually decreased. So we actually uh, got this automated in 2018. Um, but the exponential reduction is great, right? So for every compound, you can produce more data. I think what's really telling is, is also the fact that manual annotations, even though people perceive them to be uh, higher quality, we were demonstrated they're not. Um, but they can only go through 450 journals per year. Doing it, uh, we could go through all 16,000 per year, um, uh, 1,600 per year doing it automatically. So we increased the number of documents and then, of course, the number of compounds we had to increase the value. And I think what's really important as well in the outcomes is we actually reduced that, that cost. Uh, uh, after eight months' worth of work, we reduced the cost by 20%, over a million a year. But there were some lessons learned here. It's a new company, and I think every company struggles with these. Um, the first one was uh, the product-defined quality metrics. As a data scientist, you know, when they're saying 98%, they're like, we, we can never automate. Nothing is good enough in the literature that'll get you up to 98%. But when you really look under the hood at what's going on and how they arrive at that, it's not the same language as how a data scientist would arrive at that. And it took a lot of convincing, convincing my boss, convincing the company, convincing the product owners that actually uh, we need to do inner annotator agreement. We need to code this data right and actually get a metric, and that's what we compare to the machine, right? Very simple for data scientists, but really hard to incorporate into a workflow into a large company. It's something they haven't heard of before. And you're at the executive level trying to convince you know, the CEO this is the way to go. It's a huge change. What it means is, what you've been telling your customers about quality isn't. Nobody wants to have to revise that. It also means that you're telling the product people who are experts in their field that they don't have as good as quality as they did before. So it's a real cultural challenge to do this. It's not as simple as, this is my science, you do it right, I do it wrong. None of that, right? I mean, you really have to come together on this. And that took a good portion of the eight months. Um, and you have to really finesse it. And it really took getting the data scientists to work side by side with the domain experts uh, within the company to get that mutual respect so, and to start talking the same language. Um, and it, that it happened, you know, I could work from the top down, but it really had to happen from the ground up or else there was always going to be grumbling and they have to sit side by side. That was really important. Um, and, and so that really gets into cultural differences of working. Of course, you come in to do a transformation, a digital transformation in a company. 
Uh, I, I had one executive tell me, well, if you don't piss at least 50% of the people off <laughs> as a change agent, you're not doing your job right. Well, there's also a lot of insecurity. So people who work for products, oh, are we going to lose our job? People whose job it was to focus on quality, right? There's, you, you really have to take that challenge seriously and get mutual respect going. It's not about uh, replacing people who do this manually. It's about um, getting the humans to be more efficient. And also the understanding that you can't just apply an algorithm to it. You have to do this iteratively. You need those expertise to be able to code the data, tag the data, ensure that what you're getting out is right. So, um, so that was really the lesson learned there. Is uh, it's also about having the same KPIs, right? So uh, often, in particularly in data science, yeah, you want to get a good F score. What are those KPIs? Uh, sometimes uh, I've worked for companies where um, it's well, we want to have at least three publications a year. That doesn't help the company. Um, it might, in some ways, it's a great outcome if you can, but. Uh, everything that you do in data science, if you really want people to use your stuff and have an impact, customers have to use it. And then you need those customer KPIs and you need to share those with products so everybody's on the same page. Um, so here's another use case that I'll go through quickly because I need to check the time. <laughs> um, so here, the use case was another pretty simple one. Um, and this is really about the data science and engineering divide. Uh, I don't know how many of you work with companies. There's this sort of in-between role of data engineering, and nobody knows where they sit. Do they sit with the data scientists? Do they sit with engineering? Um, but you might get people from product who know you have this group that does research or AI, and they're smart people, so they might ask them to do things. And that's what happens. So we were contacted directly by the product. Um, in this particular case, it was pulling out uh, funding agencies and grant numbers from articles. You'd think it's a pretty simple task. Um, uh, so we had a business need. Uh, we had lots of data because we'd been doing this manually for a long time. Again, we had the problem that this was done manually, but inner annotator agreement had never been done. And the inner annotator agreement was actually really low, like at 50%. And this is people reading these manually. Um, so we came in, applied some NLP, uh, you know, that's the pipeline we ended up doing an ensemble method. Um, <clears throat> so that's the solution, not a hard problem. At first you do an SVM to classify does this section have uh, a, um, acknowledgement or not, and if it does then we uh, have to pull it out and, and get the name right. A little more complicated than it looks here. What was great about this project is it actually only took two months to get the data, do the annotator agreement, and get the results. And instantly, we were getting 75%. Uh, we also got two patents out of this project and uh, uh, two publications, right? So scientifically, it was fun for the data scientists who work on it, came up with the solutions. Um, but we also got the result we wanted. Um, but there were some lessons learned. So we did that in two months. Um, and, uh, and of course, I'm not going to go through all of these, but, uh, but we actually did um, uh, reduce costs of doing this manually. Uh, we got more data. We got a better F-score. Um, our performance uh, went from 48% doing it manually to, uh, you can see there, 80, 84, um, uh, to doing it automatically. So really good. You think, OK, uh, so we added to our database so funders could search our stuff. You'd think it'd be good. Well, actually, this was really tough. Uh, so it was tough for a number of reasons. But really, this one I call the engineering data science divide because um, we have data scientists working on that ensemble algorithm. They actually had more. The more you add to it, though, it adds complexity, right? And if you don't have someone who's used to working on the enterprise systems that are actually deployed with customers, you don't realize the time challenge that you're going to face, right? So uh, the computational complexity just goes up with every different algorithm you add, right? So there has to be play. Maybe your F score isn't going to be as good, but your processing time might be twice as fast um, using a different method. So that was one. What was really hard about this, the data science piece only took two months. It took eight months to get this in production. Eight months. Uh, so you think you have a solution. You think it would be, just be picked up. The product wants it. Um, but, uh, but the data science and engineering teams were really working on different roadmaps. And uh, a product asked us to do something. We did it. And then there's frustration. I, uh, for a while, it was running on someone on my team's laptop. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is production data. You don't do that. Uh, you know, I, I had to set some basic rules. 
First rule, you're never going to be in a meeting with product that engineering's not in. If it's important enough for product to put it on our roadmap, it's important enough for product to have it on engineering. It seems like a dumb rule to have, uh, and people thought, no, 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 it'll you know, squash creativity. But <coughs> it's not a dumb rule when things like this happen eight months. Um, and also, you know, it, it should never have been running on uh, someone's laptop. Uh, uh, it, it, that's just not what data scientists do. I'm not, you don't hire me if you want me in charge of enterprise systems. That's not what I do. Um, I'm happy to pass that off and have someone else get a call at 3 a.m. when the system goes down. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so it just really showed this institutional divide we had between data science and engineering. Um, and the timeline, uh, I think, at Elsevier and the company I'm currently with really work toward a Spotify model um, where uh, you have squads, product drives the timeline, but data, data science and engineering are really aligned there, right? So there's nothing we're working on our roadmap that engineering isn't aware of, uh, and it all has to be driven by product. Right, we don't have a separate roadmap for engineering, product, and data science, um, and and that it takes a while, especially in a large legacy company, to institute. Um, <clears throat> but you really also, uh, I, this really identified the gap we had, where we didn't have those those people who were really good engineers working on our enterprise software systems, who had enough knowledge of data science to to be able to give that feedback of, okay, when we actually implement this, we need to. Um, the com computational complexity is too high, we need to scale it back. Um, so that was a gap that was identified there. Um, it also took two months to get um, the testing cycle. So because of how Elsevier was organized, uh, algorithms were just sort of pushed over the fence, like, here you go, take it. Uh, and then if they ever decide that they need an update, it's like, oh, okay, I'll work on it some more, and then that testing cycle takes a long time. Uh, and it really taught us that we have to be part of that cycle, keep someone involved, and it can't take two months to do a new release. That just, uh, to run new data, get it through. Um, there's no reason on the data science side, I mean, it, it would only take for tuning a model two days, uh, but to actually get that into production took a lot longer, so we had to work on that. So I also, so those are the use cases I have from uh, um, Elsevier. I mean, I think um, I have some lessons learned at the end, but I, I also have been working the last year with a couple of startups. And, um, and I, I, you know, you'd like to think that startups have this worked out, right? They, they know how this works. Um, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, they, they have problems, too. Um, uh, and, and they also need those expertise. I think what's, what's hard in startups, um, um, there are some challenges. Uh, so first of all, startups don't start at scale. Even though there's the tools out there, they might, um, but certainly not at the data science level do they start at scale. Um, they also don't always start with customers, right? If you're lucky, you have a customer and then you build from that, but often you're working off an idea that you're building from. And from there, uh, who defines requirements? I've walked into a number of startups and I still have data scientists defining requirements for customer use, right? Uh, and often, even a company I'm currently working with, they say, oh, when we wanted to go digital, uh, the first hire we did was a data scientist. Well, that's great. That's not who you want to build production code because, face it, data scientists are not the best at building production code. Uh, but also, they shouldn't be giving the requirements, right, um, uh, for the product. You really need people who understand the product space. Um, and, but then, of course, there's this problem. Startups are very lean. They usually start with two friends, three friends. Um, uh, and you don't all have all the roles filled. You can't have you know, a complete model where you have your product person, your engineering person, and your data scientist, right? So often you have the same people filling all of those roles. Um, and there's experiment to customers still a long journey, right? So you might have a great idea, you get good feedback, you could even get funding from it, right? But to actually have recurring paying customers is a long journey, and you need to prepare for that journey. Uh, and I've certainly found that with um, both the startups that I've worked with recently. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just some lessons learned there. You need to organize for future success early on. Doesn't mean you're gonna have all the roles field, uh, but filled, but you need to at least have a vision of that. Um, 
And you have to assume you need to scale. And that means, look, we can do some cool data science algorithms, but is it really going to work with the number of customers we need? No, not always. And if you don't have a really good engineer to help with that, uh, it's, not, it's going to take a long time to actually scale up when you need to. Um, there, in startups, there's a lot of technical debt by starting with the wrong people, right? So if you know you're starting at scale, uh, you know the technology you have to use. Um, but often, when you start with just a, a couple of data scientists in a room who are working on really good ideas, you're using your own machines, and you accrue a lot of technical debt because then, oh wait, great, you sold, uh, or you're doing one pilot for one customer, so then suddenly it's running in production, and suddenly you've got a whole company built on technology you don't want, right? Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, you also have to say, are your customers ready for that transition, right? So are you in a field where it's a great idea, you can get funding, but, uh, and this happens a lot in the financial industry or other industries, the insurance industry, um, real estate industry, where people are like, no, nah, but I have someone doing the appraisal, I, I don't want to do it automatically, right? So uh, customers may, may not quite be ready for your solution. Um, so the major learnings that I'll go through today, uh, um, I think what's really important, both culturally in a large company, also for customers, is that we need to think about AI as not replacing uh, professionals, right? In order to disrupt any industry, um, <clears throat> you have to think about it. This goes with the doctors. We worked with the professionals at Elsevier, but also in the real estate industry, as well as uh, customer service. You're not replacing the professionals, right? You're not replacing people. You're really augmenting what they do to make them more efficient. Yes, there is cost savings, but that's not always the only goal. And I think what was always really important for me is demonstrating not only did we save cost savings, which, you know, of course, your boss in operations loves, we're getting better quality out of this, right? We're actually putting better data out, which means we have a better product. Uh, and the two have to work together. Um, and, and I think as a data scientist, you really have to understand that in order to help a whole company transform and uh, to, to move. Um, there's, there's always a debate, product engineering and data science, where should they be located? Should they be matrix? Should be, they be part of the same team? Every company goes through this, and every new CEO is going to come in and change it, right? Um, and it really depends on the value you're getting out of the data science team. I, I, I've been running data scientists for a long time. You're not getting value out of your data science team if they're in isolation. You just aren't. And um, that's important to learn. And I think it's, it's also, you know, it's a change for data scientists. They like to be isolated. They have their own methods. The first thing any team will say is they don't understand what we do. They don't understand our process. Uh, no, we can't work in the agile method. <laughs> I, I have taught so many teams to work in the agile method and say, look, you're going to do research. You're going to read for two weeks because you don't know what the best solution is. And you're going to put that on the sprint, right? And, and it, then it makes the products people see, it's not just this black box that we're asking for. We actually see what they're doing. And oh, OK, so it takes longer than we're used to. But then after four weeks, six weeks, uh, they've had a few sprints together. They actually see something come from it. And they've been appraised of the whole process because they've been in sprints. Getting data scientists to, to work in an agile uh, has been hard. But it's actually useful. And then they feel part of the team. And they feel that sort of collective uh, responsibility. Um, it's really important. You have to get your data scientists to work that close with product. And no matter how you're organized from the top down, they have to work that close with product and engineering. Um, yeah, I, I think we all know this in this room, build for scale at the beginning. So it's easy to have a pilot, right? And, and one of the things that I think is important is, you know, pick at low-hanging fruit where, uh, so the examples I showed you um, in the first uh, year or so I was, I, I was at Elsevier, um, the CEO and executive team liked it so much they put it in front of the board of the directors, right? Low-hanging fruit that had a big impact. In eight months, this is what we did with, with this many people, right? And this is an ongoing cost savings that'll happen for years. So it, picking a low-hanging fruit doesn't necessarily mean um, uh, uh, that you have to pick something really complex. Right, so I think that often, you know, if I came into Elsevier before doing that and said, "Look, we really need to tra we need a whole new platform here. It's going to take two years to get the backbones up before you see any value." That's not going to work. At the same time, when you're designing things in your head, you still need to know, okay, we really should be 
changing. This is just a cog in a wheel that needs to change overall because after two years, you want to see basics of the platform change to do what you want. Right, um, so, so even though we picked low-hanging fruit, you still have that bigger model in mind as you move forward. Um, so I, I think also really important, even, even in startups, and uh, is don't underestimate the cultural divide. And I, and I don't just mean that in, uh, in a diversity way, the cultural divide between men and women on the team. Uh, my teams are usually global teams uh, all over the world. Uh, there is that cultural divide. Even now in the times of corona, the time divide is huge as well. That's something that's been a challenge uh, just to get everyone in the same time zone. Um, but it's also that cultural divide in roles, especially a company that's 100 years old. People have been working this way for a long time. You don't want to be that person that comes and says, oh, I'm going to change it. I'm going to do everything. It's just going to be great. Right? You have to respect what's come before you. You have to respect the customer base and how that company was built up. And I think that often companies see the data science team and the AI just getting a lot of attention. Every CEO is saying, this is the direction we need to move. Uh, and, and I think that also leaves the people who have been there, been doing a good job for a long time, sort of feeling a bit out in the cold. Uh, and, and that may be obvious, um, but I can tell you that most data scientists working on their problems don't think about that. They're, they don't really care how people are feeling. <laughs> uh, they are liking the numbers they see. Uh, but as a leader, you really need to take that a, a, into consideration. And I have had so many things hung up on that cultural divide. Uh, or get stalled, or we're not quite ready for it yet. And it's not that they're not ready for the technology, it's just that it's a bit too much change for a company going through a transition um, that's disruptive. So uh, with that, um, uh, these are just reiterating some of the same points. I'll leave it here. Um, things that are important. In, in all of my uh, roles where I've been successful, whether as a contractor or an employee, I think Having support from the top down is really important. You're not going to uh, institute change or really see your AI have an impact if you don't have support from the top. That's both to change uh, KPIs, uh, make tough decisions, decisions on resourcing that you need. I was asked to come to Elsevier, move my family. Uh, and the one question I asked in my interview to my CEO and the CEO was, <coughs> um, you're asking me to do this, will it come with resources, right? I can't do this with two or three people. Uh, and, and it did, and I had a lot of support. It would have been impossible otherwise. But it's also to make those tough decisions, right, uh, to have that support from the top. Um, if you just have one division who's supportive uh, and the top isn't necessarily, it's just mostly lip service, you're really not going to get anywhere. And of course, the others that we've already talked about, how to organize change management, and, and having that demonstrable impact is really important. You don't want to say, thanks for hiring me. In two years, you're going to see something great. <laughs> That's just not going to work. All right, so with that, I'll, uh, and getting the right expertise, of course, but I think we have a room full of that. So, All right, well, then I want to thank you, thanks. Michelle, for being here. Yeah.